Hello, welcome all uh, to this great initiative uh, by the Hellenic Center, uh, which in a collaboration with the Society for Modern Greek Studies aims at introducing to you uh, modern Greek writers uh, whose work has been translated and published uh, in English. My name is Liana Yanakopoulou, and I will be sharing with you today uh, my thoughts on the poetry of Katerina Angelaki Rook, who sadly uh, left us earlier this year uh, in February at the age of 81. Uh, I will be reading poems to you uh, in full or extracts, uh, and they all but one will come from the volume The Scattered Papers of Penelope, uh, edited by Karen Van Dyck and published by Anvil in 2008. Uh, this elegant volume uh, includes a selection of translations uh, from uh, well-known, dedicated translators of modern Greek writing. Uh, I will be mentioning the names of those translators after each reading. Katerina is uh, the daughter of Yanis Angelakis uh, from Asia Minor uh, and Eleni Stamati from Patras. Her godfather is none other than uh, the very well-known novelist Nikos Kazantzakis. Uh, many of you will know him as the author of Zorba the Greek, um, who encouraged her uh, to write uh, and, uh, you know, uh, supported her very first publication at the age of 17. Uh, she was born in Athens uh, in 1939, but it is the island of Aegina that held a very special place in her heart. Uh, the family owned a house there, and you can see on this slide, um, you, you can see on this slide uh, where Aegina is, uh, south of Athens, in the middle of the Saronic Gulf, and uh, some uh, pictures of the family home where Angelaki Rook spent her summers. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, where she uh, went back uh, throughout her life. Uh, this house was for her a heaven of inspiration, a, a writing retreat, a place where she would welcome friends, but also share her thoughts on the work of uh, aspiring writers. She dedicated a poem uh, to the island entitled Egina, and uh, you can see there uh, the importance of it in her creative work. It becomes a space where time is suspended, uh, where you know the imagination can be set free and the creative process can begin. Um, it is in the translation uh, of the poet herself uh, with um, Jackie Wilcox. Eina, returning home from the sea, my mother and I always stopped to rest under the same olive tree. She would tell me the tale of the ant and the cicada, first lessons in restraint and wisdom, while above our heads the poet shrieked with passion in the sizzling heat. Mother, what winter do you mean? What misfortunes? What cold and hunger? The miracle is this, it starts with the heat ends as soon as day enters the shadows. The seeds are surrounded on all sides. It's the ant who finds them, while the mindless gray creature falls silent and freezes. Poor mother, you gave birth to a cicada who is incapable of hoarding. At daybreak, I would sneak out of bed, dragging my nightgown over plants and ditches. I saw the garden as an endless domain, the hens important personages absorbed in their pecking. Time in the summer had no meaning. The field was eternity, the water wheel turned its infinite round. I dived into the hay, rolled between the horse's legs. All joys ended at the sea, and there new ones began. Even then I had fashioned two selves, the one sitting peaceful and snug and well disposed to all around, the other thrilled by the danger an unknown body hides. I called the winter peace, the summer madness, and turned into an angel in winter, a devil in the heat. Mother was shocked by my two natures. I blame the two worlds, she said, 
the apartment block and the island. But winter is coming soon. What can she do? She'll have to settle down. Katerina Angelaki Ruk uh, studied foreign languages and uh, translation at university, and she was fluent in Russian, French, and English. Uh, she was an acclaimed translator of, uh, among others, Dylan Thomas, um, Shakespeare, Anna Akhmatova, Marina Tsvetaeva, uh, and of course, Alexander Pushkin. Uh, she actually speaks uh, with great uh, pride of her translation of uh, Eugene Onegin. And of course, her own work has been translated uh, in many languages, uh, among them uh, French uh, and English. And you can see here some volumes uh, of English translations. I met Angelaki Rook many years ago on the occasion of an evening of readings of her poetry. And I remember how loud and boisterous she was. I met Angelaki Rook many years ago in 2008 on the occasion of the launch of this book from which I have been reading to you today. And I remember uh, how loud, how lively and fun and boisterous she was. Uh, she certainly lived her life to the full. And I think that this sense of unconstrained vitality uh, is reflected in her poetry. This is all the more admirable because it is resting, as she says herself, on pain, on a wound. Um, and this is something that she makes abundantly clear uh, in the poem, The Scar. Uh, I will read to you now uh, in the translation of uh, Katerina Angelaki Rook and Jackie Wilcox. The scar. <clears throat> Instead of a star, a scar shone over my birth. The pain my uncongealed body suffered pushed me back into the original darkness. I crawled on nothingness, my tiny fingers clutching death like a shiny black toy. I don't remember how I came to blossom into a wound, how I learned to find a balance between puce and my open eyes. But at the point where my mother had assumed that like a leaf on the water, I'd be carried off on my first journey by the stream of death, she unexpectedly saw me emerge from the dark. Who knows what exchanges were made that night, what I gave and what I took, what I renounced, what I was promised so life would keep me in its service. <clears throat> was it blackmail, agreement or threat? Should I be grateful? for the butchered gift of existence or vengeful? Had I been ordered to look up or to cast my eyes down to the roots of forgiveness? Forgiveness for what? What was this crushing weight that had exhausted me even before I had set off? Or had I taken up another burden that I'd carry limping to the end? I lived and I began to play. Trustingly, I learned, I leaned upon the brace and climbed the stairs. In the attic, I built the kingdom of my dreams with paper cutouts. I called it Florence, my magic city with its delicate ladies and gentlemen in hats. Next to the door stood the water tank that thundered now and then above the insubstantial actions of my heroes. The warmth of this world drifted up from below the kitchen filled with smells, familiar sounds, household voices. What time is it? Have you peeled the potatoes? The kitchen and my paper imagination. Can the two poles of my existence have been fixed so early? As you can see, she speaks openly about the health problems that have marked her from birth and which accompanied her throughout her life causing increased disability. In the lines I just read to you, uh, the poet wonders what kind of exchanges took place uh, the night of her birth that allowed her to live even though she brushed shoulders with death. Well, whatever this may have been, what I find empowering is the gratitude Angela Kirouk feels uh, when, she's, uh, you know, when she speaks of her health issues, describing them as her ticket uh, to the many precious gifts she has received throughout her life happiness, passion, love, companionship, but above all, the gift of poetry. 
Pain and disability are perhaps one of the reasons why the body holds such a central place in her work. Another reason, of course, is because she was such a deeply physical and sensual person. A third reason yet <coughs> is because, uh, of course, being a woman writer, she wanted to put the female body at the very center of her poetry. Uh, titles uh, of collections and poems indicate that uh, a fair desert is the flesh, Magdalene, the vast mammal, when the body, poems such as uh, the body is a triumph and the defeat of dreams, they all highlight uh, the point I am making now. Um, and many have observed, obviously, that uh, the very first line of her first collection, um, uh, you know, uh, highlights the, the centrality of the body again. She writes, my body became the beginning of a journey. And what a journey this has been, uh, full of adventures, uh, full of knowledge, as her beloved poet Cavati would have said, but above all, full of sensual perfume of every kind. Um, yes, because uh, sensuality, eros, is in fact, uh, you know, in its most physical aspect, is in fact at the center of her work uh, and binds together spirituality and uh, sensuality. Uh, in her prose poem, Writing, we can clearly see uh, how poetry and lovemaking complement each other, how they are become, uh, becoming part of each other, uh, actually fusing into each other uh, in highly suggestive and daring imagery. I will be reading it to you in the translation again of uh, Katerina Angelaki Rook and uh, Jackie Wilcox. Writing. The obscene gesture I make when I take up my pen while something stirs in the slight breeze, the skin of my nature. As when the poor soul slowly raised his arm and surrounded me with modest glory, his gurgling voice like that of a child reciting heroic verses before being put to death. His hand with its bitten nails slowly entered me until I became the motion of my own burial. That contact ended each poem. I bring my table and my papers to this new erotic landscape. I get down to writing. I set the machinery in motion. By the third line, my new inspirer has totally conquered me. I understand how he lives and how he saps me. My imaginings begin to be more than my actions. My hands sweat. I put down my pen, wipe the three fingers holding it on my fat thighs. Creation is in full swing. What I find impressive here, as in many other poems, is how confident Angelaki Rook's voice is and how assertive it is also in relation to her own body and to the male body too. There is no inhibition, no reserve, uh, no coyness. Uh, the poet Alicia Stallings uh, was right, uh, I think, uh, when she emphasized uh, how Angelaki Rook's stance towards the male body uh, opens up new perspectives uh, in modern Greek poetry. Uh, that's absolutely true, actually, uh, because we are usually, you, you know, we are usually um, used to uh, hearing about uh, a male uh, gaze on an eroticized passive female body. Where well, here we have uh, the exact opposite in Katerina Angelaki Rook's poetry, we have a female gaze uh, looking with longing and desire on an eroticized male body, as these lines, actually, as the poem The Barber Shop uh, shows quite beautifully, I think. Uh, and again, this is in the translation of Katerina Angelaki Rook and Jackie Wilcox. The Barber Shop. A white rose, the barber's towel around your face, shining like a beetle, clinging to the petals. Clippings scattered on the floor were the days when I loved you so much, while the garrulous sculptor of heads cut away what time had made superfluous. Ah, that unscrupulous hand made you even more beautiful the curve of your eyebrows more clearly defined, and beneath the jade of your eyes, your flowers, your lips half opened. The shop impressed itself on my mind in all its detail, and little by little, 
the nothingness which my life would soon become without you came crawling into the scented room. You smiled in the mirror and I crumbled because I had you and would lose you like life classically cut short by a pair of ancient scissors. I hope you like that. Uh, as well as subverting the traditional image of the passive and submissive female, what I also like is that we do not find in Katera, Katerina Angelaki Rook's poetry uh, the angry or frustrated voice uh, that we would perhaps expect uh, in, the, um, in the poetry uh, of a feminist. Uh, I, I'm thinking of the case of uh, Hilda Doolittle, for example. Uh, nor do we find uh, any sarcasm uh, or, um, or cynicism uh, or subversive irony, uh, as uh, in the case of uh, Carol Ann Duffy. Katerina loves men as she appears proud and comfortable in her relationships and happy in her marriage. Uh, in her interviews, uh, she speaks uh, with, a pa with, passionate, uh, with passion about the loving and caring relationship she had uh, with her husband, uh, Rodney Rook, um, the, uh, the classicist. Um, she speaks with longing uh, and uh, remembers uh, with great love uh, how they met in 1963 uh, when she was uh, 24 years old of their wedding a few months later in a little church by the Acropolis and, on the law, and of the long and loving life they had together for 42 years before he died. Uh, and he was, and she keeps repeating that and emphasizing that he was very supportive of her and of her writing. Now, this is not to say that she is not aware or is not sensitive to feminist issues, because a feminist she certainly was. As Karen Van Dyke, her translator, explains uh, in the introduction uh, from the book I have been reading to you today, her poetry can be seen to fit into the tradition of the best American feminist poetry alongside Adrian Rich uh, and Anne Sexton, uh, where writing the body and rewriting the myth uh, become central concerns. Angelaki Rook herself clearly points out in her interviews and in her writing uh, to the challenges that women writers, uh, Greek women writers face um, in, uh, in uh, this traditional uh, a patriarchal society uh, with its established, uh, you know, social behaviors, uh, male-defined social behaviors. Uh, she wants women to become free of all that. She wants them to find their own feminine identity uh, in terms of their own consciousness. And this is exactly what she feels that her poetry is doing. Uh, revisionist myth-making is unmistakable, uh, for example, in an early poem of 1963, Iphigenia's refusal. This is a long poem, and I will only read to you, uh, you know, a few, a couple of stanzas translated by Sarah Egdawi. This is a poem that is not in the collection that I have mentioned here. Uh, but note how the young princess refuses to sacrifice herself uh, to, a, to, a, to the altar of a social order that perpetuates violence and death, and where women become victims of uh, male ambition and uh, military intransigence. Iphigenia said no. She said it was for love and purity of heart and peaceful little towns and so that we could tend our trees ready for rain when it came. It was for pastures green and for the angels. She said no, let's not have fighting men. Let's leave our castle standing with lovely ivy on the walls. Let our children live to be old, and let there be joy. And she ascended into heaven. So it is clear, I think, here that the woman, woman is not the vulnerable other or, of man or the, the passive or the victim, but a confident, assertive human being. Um, Angelaki Rook insists, however, that her poetry does not follow any specific feminine theory, but being a woman, she can only feel and experience and therefore write as a woman. Uh, better still, uh, she is a writer who is very keen to uh, share, to open up with us readers, the female perspective on creation. In one of her most 
iconic poems, a favorite of mine actually, Penelope says, uh, the poet recasts traditional elements of the Homeric myth uh, into her own female poetic. She does away, for example, uh, with the traditional associations of female creativity with knitting and weaving, uh, focusing directly and quite literally on writing. Uh, I will read the whole poem to you uh, in the translation of Karen van Dyck. Uh, and as I read, please uh, listen to how Odysseus's absence causes unbearable pain and suffering because of course Penelope loves him, but also it opens up the space that allows her to develop uh, as a writer and uh, find her own identity and her, her own consciousness. It is indeed this absence that triggers the writing process and also note that this is a choice of Penelope and not uh, something that is imposed upon her. Uh, she says, I forget you with passion. This is something she's actually um, creating herself. Listen also on how ingeniously she's using the weaving metaphor uh, to indicate how her rewriting um, uh, of tradition uh, is actually taking place. She speaks of cutting the thread that bind her to a particular man. Really, I think the thread that bind women to traditional perceptions and expectations and her poetry hopes to free them of these bounds. Finally, see how the female body is at the center of it all, suffering pain and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, loneliness. Uh, but also becoming a, a promise of constant birth. I should say actually this before I read the poem, that in many interviews, uh, Angela Kiruk emphasizes how alongside art, um, it is the female body in its ability to reproduce that is the, um, uh, the um, only hope that humanity has against death. And she compares this of course to uh, the cycle of nature. So Penelope, uh, says, here it is, uh, as I said in the translation of Karen van Dyck. Penelope says, uh, there is an epigraph by Daniel uh, Weisbord, and your absence teaches me what art could not. I wasn't weaving, I wasn't knitting, I was writing something, erasing and being erased under the weight of the word because perfect expression is blocked when the inside is pressured by pain. And while absence is the theme of my life, absence from life, tears and the natural suffering of the deprived body appear on the page. I erase, I tear up, I stifle the living cries. Where are you? Come, I'm waiting for you. This spring is not like other springs. And I begin again in the morning with new birds and white sheets drying in the sun. You will never be here to water the flowers, the old ceiling dripping under the weight of the rain with my personality dissolving into yours, quietly, autumn-like. Your choice heart, choice because I have chosen it, will always be elsewhere. And I will cut with words the thread that bind me to the particular man I long for until Odysseus becomes the symbol of nostalgia sailing the seas of every mind. Each day, I passionately forget you that you may be washed of the sins of fragrance and sweetness and finally all clean enter immortality. It is a hard and thankless job. My only reward is that I understand in the end what human presence is, what absence is, or how the self functions in such desolation in so much time, how nothing can stop tomorrow. The body keeps remaking itself, rising and falling on the bed as if axed down, sometimes sick, sometimes in love, hoping that what it loses in touch, it gains in essence. You can see here again how writing and the body are interlaced, but also how pain and absence are at the core of this creative process. 
Indeed, another constant of her poetry uh, is the idea that art is produced to counteract solitude and the deprivation of a beloved person, indeed to counteract the ultimate uh, of separations, death. She begins, for example, uh, uh, another very well-known poem of hers, uh, translating life's end into love uh, with the following lines. Because I cannot touch you with my tongue, I transliterate my passion. Because I, can, because I cannot take your communion, I transubstantiate you. Because I cannot undress you, I imagine you in the clothes of a foreign language. And I do like here the idea in the title of uh, translation being associated uh, uh, with, this uh, with this recasting of emotions and experiences uh, into uh, art. The essence of her poetry, uh, however, uh, at the end of the day is uh, beyond gender, uh, since I feel, and of course she says that too, uh, it touches upon universals which, if any, have the gender of humanity. Just as every human being, she is vulnerable, like we all are, uh, to time, uh, illness and death. And art seems to be the greatest weapon that counters uh, these universal human challenges. I would like to finish uh, this presentation with a reading of her prose poem, The Cicada, that brings back brings us back full circle uh, to uh, the beginning of this presentation, the hot summers of Egina, I mentioned there. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, with uh, a poetic statement in this case clearly expressed, uh, becoming at the same time uh, another very interesting uh, case of uh, revisionist myth-making. Uh, in this case, um, in relation to Aesop's fables, uh, because we are told that the cicada is not actually uh, the uh, irresponsible, carefree, lazy singer that uh, Aesop has actually told us, but uh, it is a singer, a creator, uh, whose song is a cry of survival from the heat. Uh, so poetry, we should actually, we are encouraged to, 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 uh, to think, is such a cry of survival. Uh, the creative drive uh, is presented here as a suspension of time uh, and uh, a counterweight to death. The Cicada, uh, it translated by Gail Holst Warhaft. Thousands of summer songs accumulate inside me. I open my mouth and in my passion, try to put them in order, badly. But thanks to my song, I stand out from the gray uh, I stand out from the branches and from the other voiceless sound boxes of nature. My simple dress, gray and lime white, bars me from every excess of aestheticism. And so, cut off from the rowdy festival of time, I sing. I ignore spring, Easter and violets. The only resurrection I know is when a faint breeze manages to stir and slightly cool the burning heat of my life. Then I stop howling, or as the world thinks, singing, because the miracle of coolness deep inside me says more than all I create so as not to die of the heat. Well, uh, thank you for staying with us. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Goodbye. <laughs>